Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be back at uh, IIM Raipur. Many thanks for the invite that you've given me for this, uh, for this event. It's, it's my first TEDx, so you have me blooded now. Thank you very much. I'm really honored. Uh, I had come here about 15 months back, and uh, the topic I'd spoken about on that day was very similar to today's topic. Let me assure you that my thoughts on the subject have not changed. And therefore, so that I do not repeat myself, I've given it some more considerable thought to say, what else can I actually share with probably a similar group that, that uh, attended my talk the last time that I was here? So, I think I'll start with saying that we all know and believe that in India, in our country, we've got an India and a Bharat. And we know that the challenges that are faced across many parameters, women's empowerment being one of them, the challenges faced in India and Bharat are completely different. So to begin with, let's look at my definition of what women's empowerment is. So in that term, women's empowerment, there are two words there. One is woman and the other is empowerment. You know, I, I was just discussing this with my husband last night uh, as to, uh, you know, what in your mind is a woman. And so he reminded me of what he had updated on his Facebook the day we got married. He had written, selling my encyclopedias, do not need them, wife, wife knows everything. Okay, so he said, you know, that's what a woman is. So I sat on the latest uh, form of dictionary, which is Google, right? And I Googled on the term woman, right? I didn't get any, anything that could be quoted here. And uh, therefore I said, women, funny quotes, let me see what do I see, okay? And I got something very interesting. The first one was the creation from the ribs of a man. The second one was the perfect creation after God's draft, a draft creation of Adam. And the third one, which I think is my personal favorite, is that God created women second because he did not want Eve to advise him on how to create Adam. Okay? That's women, and then added to that was my husband's uh, definition of saying, selling encyclopedia, don't need them, wife knows everything, okay? Then we come to the second term called empowerment, okay? And when I googled this term and went to mariamwebster.com and so on, there are a lot of very, very heavy definitions of this term called empowerment. And therefore I said, let me, let me search within me to see what is the definition of empowerment for me. And I, when I looked at that, I thought, empowerment is really the power and freedom to choose opportunities to build and enhance my skills, my abilities, and my capability to do what I wish to do. And that to me is my definition of empowerment. Just as some of the speakers before me said, there are many kinds of empowerment, but this is my personal definition. I haven't given the definitions and set the context of what I'm really going to talk about. I would like to share some very appalling statistics here. 70% of the world's poorest are women. Across all developing countries in the world, the amount of land owned by women is less than 2%. 72% of the world's refugee population of over 40 million are women. One million people get trafficked across national borders in a year. 80% of them are minors and girls. 50%, sorry, 80% of it are women and girls. 
50% of which are minors. Half of the world's AIDS affected population are women. About two thirds of the world's adult population without the lowest level of literacy are women. Across developing countries, one out of five children, that makes it 20%, one out of five girls who will attend school, primary school, will not complete primary school. So if you look at all of these facts as an aggregate, it's a very, very scary picture. But we are lucky, we are not the only ones thinking about it, because Women's empowerment is also a very fashionable topic to be discussed. It is discussed at all the right forum. It's not just us in this august room who are talking about it. So if you look at all the two-letter and three-letter global organizations, let's look at a couple of them. The UN, the ADB, the ILO, the WLP, which by the way I learned was Women's Learning Partnership. Okay. Leading consulting firms, leading legal firms, they're all thinking about it. They've all done extensive studies on the topic. They've done extensive analysis of this. And they've published reports. Women are 50% of the human race on this planet. Does it really require economics and monetary profitability to decide whether I need to be included or not? That is a question that you know I put forth to all of you and to all the policymakers and so on and so forth. And I came across this article on quartz.com actually. It's very interesting reading. It says that, uh, as we all know, we are, most of us are management teachers or students here. In 2013, the government enacted a new Companies Act, which replaced the old 1956 one. And this mandated that every board of a listed company on the National Stock Exchange required at least one woman on its board. On the National Stock Exchange, we've got a total of 1,470 companies. So at best, we require 1,470 women to sit on each of those boards. The deadline was October of 2014. A couple of weeks before October 2014, one of the biggest conglomerates in India, well at least by market cap, appointed a lady onto their board to comply with this law. You know, the only coincidence was that this lady was married to the billionaire chairman of the company. Okay? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That company, just like any other company, um, can choose anyone that their shareholders seem fit to actually sit on their board. But the problem is that it also confirmed one of the fears that the government had, and that is that this mandate was going to be complied with only through nominating people from the promoter's family. Okay? It was a kind of a perverse consequence of a very well-intended enactment of law. That's fine, that's just a single case, right? But what's shocking is the story before that and the story after that. And that is uh, a, leading, uh, a leading industrial body did some study and they found out that before 2013 when this law was actually enacted, company heads were strongly against this particular mandate that was going to come in. There was significant lobbying. They believed that there was no need to have a woman on the board because they first of all thought that the number of women having those skills in India would be woefully small and therefore it would be a challenge to find those numbers. 
Can you imagine? In India, we've got 586 million women. Even if we assume that only 1% of them are educated, I mean, that's the worst case scenario, right? Even if we assume that there's only 1% of those women or 0.5% of those women in corporate circles, I'm sure 0.05% of women would have been enough. But that didn't happen, right? So finally, with all the lobbying, they, they got the next best option. And the next best option was one seat at the board, which could be easily complied by membership from the promoter's family. What makes it worse is, there is an industrial body called PhD Chamber, and they went and interviewed seniors, board members of 66 companies that were listed on, 66% of uh, the companies listed on the National Stock Exchange. There were many companies who until then did not have a single woman on their board. Almost 25% of these companies which then did not have a single woman on the board, their board members reverted to the survey saying that they did not want women on the board because they did not think women were mentally suited for the job. And what, what surprises somebody like me is let us leave Bharat aside. Let us leave India aside. We are a large country. We are a diverse country. We are a complex country. Let's leave all that aside. And if we only look at that, that small piece of corporate India, the shining India, the rising India, the successful India, the educated India, that's what we really think about our women. I mean, I don't know whether there's hope for, you know, the rest of the women in the country. And I'm only talking about India here. So then the point is this, that these are very strong words, do not have the capability, are not mentally fit, etc., etc. The question to women like me is, is that reality? And because I'm a woman, I'd like to think that it's not reality, it's perhaps perception. And perception, if not killed early, will turn into reality very quickly. I mean, on one side you have these, these calculating messages saying that because it will serve the economy and the monetary profitability, let's have more women. Second, it says, oh, they're not intelligent enough, but you, Mr. Government, are telling me to put them there, and therefore I'm putting them there. I mean, if this is not calculating how what is, okay? And, you know, against women, I mean, I believe that, well, it's not my belief, I read this about Oscar Wilde, where he said that women would never quote their age accurately because it would show them as calculating. Okay? So women are not calculating. You know, let's let's just go by that. But whatever that case may be, the point here is really that if that's a perception, and if that's a perception that we have to kill today, because if we don't kill it today, it's only going to get worse, fatter, darker, hairier, and uglier. What is it that we need to do? And I think when I search the inners of myself, I think that the problem is probably women wait for things to be given to them because they are used to it. And maybe that's where we make the paradigm shift. As mothers, you know, I do remember I so I come from a I come from a solid matriarchal background where in my house my father was heavily outnumbered because I had uh, my maternal grandmother, my mother, my sister, and myself. Can you imagine the plight of poor Mr. Nair? I mean, all of us hugely strong women, and by hugely, I don't mean physically, uh, but I, I do mean extremely strong, spiritually strong women. Um, and I do remember when my little nephew was born, he was one day playing with a broom with the, which the maid had just left around somewhere. And my grandmother was absolutely hysterical. So we asked her, why was she screaming? And she said that, oh, look, the little boy has a broom in his hand. So we didn't understand what it was. We said, yeah, okay, we, we take it. We thought she was scared that he'd catch an infection or something from the broom. So we quickly took the broom, set it aside, and we told her, is that okay? She said, no, you need to hide the broom. A boy should never be seen with a broom. After that, my sister made it a point to give my nephew the broom every day. Okay? 
I mean, he was just one and a half. I doubt whether he even remembers it now. But, but let us not have division of labor defined on the basis of gender. Why should it be necessary? Okay. The last point that I wanted to actually add here is do not forget the responsibility that we have as parents to children when we have them. Because we are supposed to raise good sons to ensure that they go further and become good brothers and good husbands and good fathers to their own sons and daughters. Do not think that the future generation is going to take care of whatever gender gap as it exists today. It's certainly not going to happen unless we solve this problem today or at least we start solving this problem today. Women of this country, after hearing the statistics, I think it is adequately justified if you were offended by the emotions that you heard from people who answered the survey. Because if we are not offended, we are not going to react. And if we don't react, nothing is really going to change. That does not mean hate the men. With that, I'm really going to leave you for this evening. I hope uh, you've had a good time. You've been a brave audience. You've listened to me after five hours of incessant talking by brilliant speakers. Um, Thank you very much. All the best to you. And may the tribe of women power increase. Thank you very much. You know, you know for, for a woman going through a midlife crisis, that's the best thing that can happen. You know, a couple of boys standing and whistling there. Thank you very much. <laughs>